Good morning. I love seeing our kids come up and sing songs of Christ and read scripture to us. It's so important for them to know God's word and to love the Lord and it's always a blessing. If you would, open your Bibles to Isaiah 9 and verse 6. Isaiah 9 in verse 6. The prophet Isaiah here is speaking God's word to God's people and says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you this morning, and we thank you for the time of worship that we've already enjoyed, and we pray that that would continue through the preaching of your word, and that we would um, have our hearts set on Jesus this morning the author and perfecter of our faith, that he would be the reason for the season. We thank you, Lord, especially in this time as we celebrate the incarnation of our Lord who was willing to leave his throne and take upon human nature so that he could represent his people before the judgment seat of God. We thank you for this prophecy that has been fulfilled completely in Jesus Christ. And we thank you for your word that has been preserved for us, and we pray that it would bless us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to give us a little bit of insight of what's going on here in Isaiah 9, because that's always important. If you don't know the context, then you make it say whatever you want it to say. And so it's important to know the context and to kind of feel the emotion of what's going on if you were here when this was being stated. In Second Chronicles 25 2 we're told that Amaziah who was king did what was right in the eyes of the Lord yet not with a whole heart and so there was some religion some worship of of the Lord going on but not with a whole heart and you can read more there if you would like in 2nd Chronicles 26 4 we see Uzziah and that should be a familiar name. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah had done. So Amaziah, remember, did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, yet not with a whole heart. And Uzziah uh, did the same. And you'll remember him, the king, from the very well-known chapter 6 of Isaiah where he has died. And Isaiah is thinking, what's going to happen now? And Isaiah had the vision of the Lord in which his response to that vision was, woe is me. In 2 Chronicles 27, 2, Jotham did what was right in the eyes of the Lord according to all that his father Uzziah had done, except he did not enter the temple of the Lord, but the people still followed corrupt practices. And in 2 Chronicles 28, 1 and 2, Ahaz, King Ahaz, did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as his father David had done, but he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, the northern kingdom. He even made metal images for the Baals. So this is a progression from father, son, and father, son, and father, son, and this is where we are in Isaiah chapter 9. King Ahaz is on the throne, and he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and he also made metal images for the Baals. This is a time um, in the history of Israel of great idolatry. It's a time where not only the king were told, but the majority of the nation had turned away from the Lord. 
and it was a time of many armies warring against Judah. Assyria, Syria, Egypt, the Philistines, the Edomites, even the northern kingdom of Israel with Syria was against Judah. And so it was a, it was a horrific time of war and suffering and a time of feeling the wrath of their enemies upon them. And in chapter 6, you'll recall, Isaiah fo- volunteers to be a mouthpiece for the Lord. And we're given some insight into how the people were and how they would remain in the ministry that was given to Isaiah, because Isaiah said, I'll do this. I'll be the mouthpiece for you, Lord. Send me. And God said, well, let me tell you what the ministry is going to be like. And what Isaiah was told is every pastor's worst nightmare. The people will not listen to the truth. The people will not care about the truth. The people will not see the blessing of truth. The people won't seek to understand the truth because they do not love me. And Isaiah's response was, I think, the response that any pastor would give. How long do I have to do this? Right? You remember? How long, O Lord? That's not a ministry that's suited up for fame, is it? It's not a ministry that's going to be overflowing with converts and faithful people in the kingdom And God's response was, how long until the land is desolate and without inhabitants? So that leads us to verse 9, because in spite of all this, in spite of all the rebellion of the people, and in spite of all the idolatry, and in spite of them practicing occult things, um, in spite of them doing all kinds of abominations before the Lord, and not caring about Him, and turning their back upon Him, God is still gracious. God is still gracious. It's a, it, it's a graciousness that there's not a single person on this planet has ever been able to fully comprehend. Because we're not gracious like that. Somebody crosses us and we're usually like the disciples, shall we? Call down fire from heaven, right? God's graciousness is in spite of not because of, but in spite of their rebellion and in spite of their idolatry and in spite of their suppression of his truth and in spite of their hatred towards him and in spite of them trusting in horses and chariots rather than trusting in him at this time. And we come to Isaiah 9 and God gives this promise, a promise that God will deliver his people. And he shares with them there is a time coming that there will be peace for God's people. A time in which God will save his people and there will be a new government. It's interesting to note that what God is promising, he says in this chapter 9 previous verses that it will be similar to the day of Midian. That's very interesting that he says this um, in verse at the end of verse 4. The way I'm going to do this is very similar to the day of Midian. And you'll remember the day of Midian when Gideon defeated a huge coalition of armies with just 300 men. They marched into the camp and God delivered the people over to Gideon and the 300 men and caused confusion. And it was, and what what this marks out is what we see at Gideon, the day of Gideon, was a humongous victory in a small package. A huge victory in which the people of God were conquerors that came in a small package, a miraculous package. No one would ever win this battle but God. And here in Isaiah 9, we are told that there will be an even bigger victory, a much more significant victory for the people of God in a much smaller package, a child. Verse 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Now, this 
phrase here points us back to Isaiah 7 and verse 14, where King Ahaz was offered a sign from the Lord, and King Ahaz did not trust the Lord, did not believe God, did not care for a sign, and he turned God down, and God said, well, then I'm going to give you a sign. You don't get to choose, I get to choose, and here's the sign that I'm going to give to my people. And he says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. This son that will come from a virgin, he will be God in the midst of us, we're told in Isaiah 7, 14. The, this God son, this God man will bring deliverance to the people of the Lord. And a sign of his arrival will be his virgin birth from a good moral woman. Now we come back to chapter 9, verse 6. If you went to 7, it says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Not only is a child born from a virgin, which is what we're told here, and obviously we are looking back from the New Testament, we see the fulfillment of that, in Jesus Christ, but they are to look, the deliverer that they are to look for and to put their hope in and to trust the promises of God through would be born from a virgin. That's the sign. This is the sign that I've given you the deliverer that will take the government upon his shoulder and will deliver a people for himself. He will be born of a virgin. But he's not only a child born from a virgin, he is given to us through the virgin. And that's very important to note. He's given to us through a virgin. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave, what? His only son. He gave his only son through a virgin. That's how he came through the virgin, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God gave his son, and his son came through a virgin so that he could be the deliverer of his people, so that he could establish a kingdom that would be established with justice forevermore. God the Father sent his son to take upon flesh and take on the nature of those whom he would represent or actually whom he represents at the judgment seat of God. And God the Son takes the mission and completes the mission perfectly in righteousness because of the joy that it brings the Godhead to do so. Now I want us to look at some of the descriptions of the Deliverer King Son, attributes of the king's son that we are told here in Isaiah 9. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We're told the government will be upon his shoulder. It, it, government officers in, this, in, the, in the biblical days used to wear insignia on their shoulders to show that they were officials who were responsible for up, up, upholding justice in the land. And you kind of you kind of get the idea here what that grew into because Jesus said, "Oh yeah, you wear your big you know your all your garbs in the public so everybody knows who you are and everybody praises you for those things and it shouldn't be so." But they they used to wear insignia on their shoulder that represented that they were government officials and they were responsible to uphold justice in the land. This is also in stark contrast with the yoke and the staff of the oppressors that were at this time on the shoulders of Israel. But this deliverer that God is promising would come and the government would be upon his shoulders. The justice of God would be upon his shoulders. He would establish justice 
and he would establish righteousness for his kingdom and also for all those who would enter into his kingdom as citizens of the kingdom of God. We're told in the New Testament that this yoke of the Son is not hard, it's not oppressive, it's easy. The yoke of the Son is easy. He will deliver his people from the domain of darkness where rulers are corrupt and rulers use their power for personal gain at the expense of all others. But in this deliverer's use of power and authority, he will use it deliver, to deliver his people from oppression, ultimately the bondage and oppression of sin. It says, we shall say of him, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. That's one title, Wonderful Counselor. This is literally saying a wonder of a counselor. We shall call him a wonder of a counselor. This word translated wonderful is used in the majority to speak of the Lord and his works. We stand in awe at the works of the Lord and we will stand in awe at the Lord who comes as our counselor. And so we stand in awe of him. This, this is what this word means. We stand in awe of this counselor. It's the nearest word in the Hebrew language to signify supernatural. This word wonderful here in your text. The nearest word in the Hebrew language to signify the supernatural. He is a counselor. He taught with, the, we're told in the New Testament, he taught like one with authority, right? Speaking the very words of God, not like the scribes and the Pharisees, and so we stand in awe of him. He is a wonder. He is a supernatural counselor from which wisdom and blessings flow. Not only is he a wonderful counselor, but he is called Mighty God. Mighty God. This, can, this phrase, this name, can mean nothing else but that this child that is born is God incarnate. He is Emmanuel, Isaiah 7, 14. God with us. We have been told he will be born, right? A child is given to us. Unto us a child is born. So he will be human. That speaks to his humanity. And here we are told by the Hebrew word El that this child born is not only human, but he is God. He is God our hero because he has come to rescue. His name shall be called Everlasting Father. Father of eternity is another way of saying this phrase. And the word Father designates here the quality of the Messiah with respect to his people, the quality of care that he gives his people. He takes care of us like a father would take care of his family. He acts toward his people like a father. He is one who eternally is a father to his people. The tender providence and care of our shepherd king. Now and forever, we are told, he guards his people and he supplies their needs. He meets every need. There's not a sparrow that falls. There's not a hair on your head. His name is Everlasting Father. His name shall be called Prince of Peace. Now, what a wonderful title here in Isaiah 9 because all they know now is war and oppression. All they know is the yoke of bondage, the yoke of slavery, 
the yoke of being defeated, the yoke of having armies surround them constantly, and his name, the Deliverer's name, shall be called Prince of Peace. How beautiful is this name to those who believe. He seeks the greatness of his kingdom and of himself, not in war, as do ordinary rulers, but in peace. When you look through the history of mankind, what it, what it is is just constantly wanting to dominate the next people group, to, to, to expand the land, expand the kingdom, and make their name great. Well, Christ makes his name great, but he also makes his people great, and he doesn't th do it through war and oppression. He does it through peace and justice. He establishes peace. Now, how can there be eternal peace? How can there be eternal peace? Well, the cause of war must be removed. The cause of war must be removed. The cause of death must be removed. And here's the reality that we face every day and that we face in this fallen world. The cause of all trouble is sin. The cause of all trouble is sin. And the beauty of one of the most beautiful things of Christ's kingdom is sin is removed forevermore. That's how there can be no sorrow, there can be no pain, there can be no tears, there can be no sin, there can be no death, because Christ removes that. And we live in a kingdom of peace forevermore. Verse 7 tells us, Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. His kingdom is everlasting. It will not end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. We have these promises from God. Now, I want us to jump forward because when we read Isaiah 9, verse 6, it takes us back to Isaiah 7, 14. But both of these passages in Isaiah chapter 9 and chapter 7, they point us forward to Luke 2, where we are given the scenario in which the angel of the Lord appeared to the shepherds in Luke chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, and it says this, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Now, now hear Isaiah here when I read this. For unto you is born this day, Here's the fulfillment of what God promised in Isaiah 7 and Isaiah 9. God always keeps his promise. He cannot tell a lie. And this is the announcement of the Gospels. Here's the good news. You remember the promise of God to give us a deliverer? You remember the promise of God of an eternal kingdom that would come through the Davidic line and sit upon the Davidic uh, throne? Do you remember the, the promise all the way back in Genesis 3 where there would be the seed of a woman that would crush the head of the serpent and deliver a people for himself? Well, the angel says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. They, they would have known this. They would have known the scriptures. They would have been rejoicing and leaping inside because Isaiah 7 and Isaiah 9 is finally being fulfilled. On, the ver on this very day, and they're going to be witnesses of it, that the deliverer is born. And, there's, and the angel says there's good news. This is good news for everyone. Everyone, for all people. The word gospel literally means good news. And the good news is this. A child is born. 
And he is the offspring of Abraham who was foretold that when he comes, he will come with a covenant that will be a blessing to all nations. This child is born for all the nations. For everyone in Adam, this child is born. He was foretold by the prophet Isaiah, and he is, we're told, by the angel here in Luke 2 that he is Christ the Lord. Well, we know, or maybe you don't, but the word Christ means anointed. So there's, the angel is saying, the, the anointed one, the Lord, Emmanuel, God with us. The anointed deliverer of God is here. He's born this day. He is the royally anointed Lord of all. And he is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. He is the true son king of Psalm 2 who will reign in perfect righteousness, whose kingdom will never end, and whose kingdom will have nothing, and hear me on this, his, whose kingdom will have nothing but blessings to disperse upon his people. There will be no wars. There will be no famine. There will be no sorrow. There will be no death. There will be nothing but peace and joy and bliss in this kingdom because the government is upon the Messiah's shoulders. It is his government. The angels finished this saying to the shepherds in verse 14 by saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom God is pleased. Peace among those with whom God is pleased. This is a very important statement. Very important statement here. Because it's one that is constantly misunderstood, and it is misunderstood tragically. So I want to ask, I want to ask in closing this very important question. How is God pleased with us? There is no one good, no, not one. There is no one who seeks him, no, not one. There is none righteous, no, not one. How in the world can God be pleased with us? There's only one way for us to please God. In John 6, 28 and 29 a very important question was asked of Christ. I don't know the motive behind the question. It doesn't sound like they were where they needed to be spiritually to ask this question, but we can't know the heart of the person asking. But they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? What must we do to be doing the works of God? This is why the gospel is so hard for us to believe, because we always want to be the one who accomplishes. We always want to be the one who accomplishes, because we always want to be the one to receive the glory of the accomplishment. Lord, what must we do? What can I do so that you can boast in me? Matthew 7, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness, for I never knew you. But didn't we do this, 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 and this? Very important question here in John 6. Extremely important. What must we do to be doing the works of God? In other words, how can we please God? Jesus, tell me, how can I please God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, or this is how you please God. And he says that you believe in him whom he has sent. 
How can we please God? By falling at the feet of Jesus and completely and utterly resting in his personhood and his work that was completely finished on our behalf. And well, I don't know if you believe that or not, but the stumbling block is that I want to be able to say that I did it. I did it my way, as the song goes. But the gospel is that you can't do it, and you can't do enough, and you can't do it right. And so what you need is you need an alien righteousness, a righteousness outside of yourself. And the only righteous one is Jesus Christ, who was God, Emmanuel, God with us. So when the angel says, peace among those with whom he is pleased, dear friend, the only way that he can be pleased with you is if your faith is completely and utterly in Jesus Christ. The one who came and was given through a virgin. The one who in him is redemption, the forgiveness of sins. In Christ, the Lord is a righteousness given to us that is immutable. It is unchanging. It does not fade away. Moth cannot eat. Thief cannot steal. Rust cannot erode. It is an immutable righteousness imputed to our account because of the one who accomplished it on our behalf. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And so where are you, I would ask, before we close with a final song my question to you is where are you with regards to the sun king where do you stand today what does Christmas mean to you does it mean I have to impress a lot of people with all the presents that I give them or does it mean there was one that came and he's delivered me from the judgment seat of God and everything that I need to be reconciled to God is found in him. Does Christmas mean I can rest? Oh, sit back and enjoy the season because I can rest because my righteousness is found in Jesus. Oh, enjoy the rest and the family as we talk about and rest in the finished work of Jesus. Oh, let us enjoy this time and celebrate and sing because all that we need to be reconciled to God is found in Jesus. And we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins in Jesus. And we have an immutable righteousness in Jesus. What does Christmas mean to you? Do you acknowledge that you are bankrupt of righteousness? Do you acknowledge that by your sin you have offended God and brought condemnation upon yourself? Do you confess this Christmas season that you need a Savior and praise God for sending one? Do you rejoice in the Son King and his kingdom and desire to be a citizen in that kingdom. Well, there's good news because he calls us to him. Right now, the word of God is calling you to him. He calls us to him. And dear friends, it's not the government that we see in Israel and Judah in Isaiah 9. It is a just government. It is a government that brings peace and gives peace. It is a government that disperses blessings. It is a yoke that is easy. It is a government that is righteous. It is a kingdom that only gives blessings. And this call unto us towards this child is that we completely trust and rest in him. that we would put our faith exclusively in him. And so we can, can we not, have a very merry Christmas. Amen? We can have a, we can have 
the merriest Christmas of all. And no one can nor should enjoy Christmas more than those who are in Christ. Because we have an omnipotent king who gives nothing but blessings to his covenant people. Amen? Let's pray. I want to pray, and then we'll sing our closing song. And I want to remind our guests that we have a fellowship meal right after this service, and you are invited to stay. We'd love for you to stay um, and fellowship with us. And so it'll be a little bit of a time after the closing song, a little bit of a time of setup, but just fellowship. You can go out. There's coffee and stuff in the foyer and just fellowship and, and stay with us. We love it. We, we're glad that you're here, and we love fellowshipping with one another here. And so we wanna, I want to pray, and then our praise team will come and sing the closing song. Lord, we, we thank you for this wonderful gift. Not only a child is born from a virgin, but that child is given to us from you. He left the throne room of glory and took upon human nature to be obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, so that he could establish a righteous, just government and a kingdom that knows nothing but peace. And the peace of God is in every child of God. And we need only to rest in Jesus. To rest in Jesus means to rejoice in Jesus. And we are, we have so much to sing about and to praise you about and to speak about and to be joyful about. Joy to the world, amen. Because we have a sovereign king who came to us through a virgin birth to deliver us from our sin and the condemnation that it deserves. We pray that we would sing now this closing song, that we would sing it with joy for all that we have in Christ, and that we would have the merriest of Christmases, contemplating and resting and rejoicing in Jesus, our Savior. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.